Hey, welcome back to another, another episode of Church Hurts and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery thrown in. If you're like most of us, you had questions about the church, maybe a bit jaded in your attitudes towards religion overall, hey, then you've come to the right place. Because our host, well, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, and even planted a few churches along the way. He taught at a prestigious university, preached at a mega church, and was an executive coach. But now, well, he's just a self-proclaimed aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question, why? Welcome, if you will. The one man with all the questions, maybe even some of the answers today, host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bash. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. Today we're asking really some of the bigger questions. You know, the famous theologian and boxer Mike Tyson once asked or said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I like that. It rings true today as much of America and the world cowers in their homes in this storm of the invisible virus called Corona. We've been punched in the mouth and any plans we had have been put to the test. We've heard from more media, medical and media experts than ever before. We've listened to economists by the dozen and we, we hear them wax eloquent guessing about the future. but. I think something else has been going on, and it's something that usually takes a punch in the mouth. We're asking some bigger questions. Who's in charge here? How could this happen in our sophisticated scientific age? What can I do? What should I do? What if it gets me? It's in times like this that I find some wisdom in looking backwards. Has anything like this happened before? How did the church handle it? What did they do right? What did they do wrong? So today, we have one of the most qualified people I know to really help us do exactly that. His name is Carl Truman, and I'd like to take the rest of the show. No, guess I won't. I could take the rest of the show just talking about his books and his credentials. But let me say this. His specialty is historical theology which is really a soup with history and theology all mixed together, and it can be pretty healing stuff if it's cooked properly. Welcome, Carl. Great to be here, John. Rumor has it that you grew up in Dudley, England, which I think is a lot like growing up in Pittsburgh from what I can tell. So for this American audience, tell them if I'm right. Uh, well, you should never listen to rumors, John. I didn't grow up in Dudley in England. I was born in Dudley uh, uh -huh. and uh, spent the first six years of my, seven years of my life in a suburb of Birmingham, which is kind of like the Pittsburgh or the Detroit of, of England. But my, my primary memories of childhood and youth come from Gloucestershire. Really, I spent my childhood and youth in Gloucestershire. I went to school there and that's a very rural part of the, the British Isles. The Cotswolds will probably be how most uh, American listeners would be familiar with it. Uh, and yes, my mum lives in a Cotswold stone cottage on an idyllic hillside. So it is just like it appears in the shows and the movies. So I had a wonderful rural upbringing. And now, of course, I live in Western Pennsylvania, which is topographically actually very similar to Gloucestershire, different stone, but the rolling hills and the, uh, the farmlands, very, very similar. So I, at the, uh, in, in the latter part of my life, I've kind of returned to my uh, roots in a sense, now living in rural America rather than rural Britain. So isn't it nice uh, being a, a true Brit that you finally get to discover what football is? Uh, American sports, <laughs> I, they are, Here's my theory that you have to have played a sport at school to actually enjoy watching it and not having played baseball, basketball, America, what I call American football, because you rarely use your feet in it, of course. 
I have no idea what's going on. My wife and I, we're avid supporters of Grove City College Football Club, but I always have to sit next to somebody who can explain to me whether that's a good thing or a bad thing that just happened on the pitch. But I'm a rugby man myself. But uh, yes, I I do, as I say, loyal college rugby uh, football supporter at Grove City, but haven't got a clue what's going on on the pitch. Well, you, you do live in the land of black and gold, which is the best of American football. But we, we better move on and remember that the title of our show is Church Hurts and. And we're at a time when people who've been hurt or disillusioned by church still might be saying, yeah, but I, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper. And um, is there a chance that you might be able to help us removing the illusion um, as a bona fide expert in church history um, that is the church is kind of irrelevant in times like this and and maybe even take us to some stories from the past when people in the world face this kind of crisis yeah well uh, obviously uh, illness and plagues are, are nothing new in human history so there are certainly places one can go to in church history to see how the church responded to uh, previous seismic occurrences like this. The most obvious being, I think, the what, what's often called the, the Black Death or the Bubonic Plague, which, which really ravaged Europe from, from the 14th century onwards till the end of the 17th century. The, the ravaging became more sporadic and less severe as time went on, but really for... Okay, wait, let me, let me just stop you there. So because for the average person, you talk about 14th to 17th century, um, real quickly, if they're not historians, sure. they have to they, they give, give us some points of like, what, what was the world like then? Well, in the 14th century, it's what we call really the late Middle Ages. Uh, so if, if you were living in Europe at that point in time, almost certainly you would have been involved in agriculture in some way. Cities were beginning to rise and become important. Trade was beginning to develop. But on the whole, most people would have been peasant farmers or peasant agricultural workers in some way. By the time you get to the end of the 17th century, that's uh, you know, 300, 300 years, years later. Yeah. yeah, you're beginning to see the birth of the, the modern era. Obviously, America's been discovered. International trade is starting to kick off. So you, you see a huge cultural change during those 300 years. But, but one of the constants would have been uh, plague, illness, uh, coupled with very little understanding of of medicine, very you know no understanding really of of how these diseases were were carried, how they spread, how they could be treated. I often joke to students, you know, that if you find it too easy to fall asleep at night, get hold of some fifteenth century medical. Uh, handbooks and they will keep you awake till the early hours because the medical treatment uh, really prior to the I would say the late 19th century is pretty terrifying on the whole even the basics you know washing hands you know we I think for sure yeah. will remember in as we look back on this time of just have you ever heard more people talking about holding hands back then they didn't have a clue of the connection even between dirt and anything right no, and uh, one of the theories was, was of course, that bathing was bad for you because bathing opened the pores and allowed bad stuff, you know, from the vapors, the miasma, the atmosphere to, to penetrate the body. So, uh, yes, uh, when students said to me in class, which, which period of history would you most like to have lived in? I say, absolutely this one. You know, analgesics, anesthetics, flush toilets, proper hygiene. I don't want to go back even a hundred years. <laughs> okay, so, so okay, now we got the bubonic plague. We got the yeah. Black Death. We, um, what was it like for the person when people? Is they're just people are dying, right? All of a sudden, yeah. my family is starting to die off. Yes, uh, I mean the 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 disease would very much have been seen as as an act of God, really, because nobody knew where it came from, nobody knew where it disappeared to, nobody knew why it came. Uh, it was a, a presence, even when it was absent, it, it cast a shadow over things, but but nobody understood how to control it. And of course, one of the 
uh, the results of that is that the numbers of people who died proportionate to the population were, were catastrophic. Uh, in the 15th century, 14th century, with the, with the first few bouts of the bubonic plague, you know, the estimates that a third of the European population were wiped out by the plague. Now, the population was smaller than today. So in terms of absolute numbers, uh, it would be a much smaller po uh, proportion of today's population. But if you could imagine, if, if anybody on the TV was talking about the coronavirus taking out a third of the North American population, that would be beyond anything we could possibly grasp. So, so we look back as well, and it was a different political system as well, though, in terms of, um, so people are dying. Who, who's in control? Well, Europe is very, in, in the Middle Ages, by the time we get to the 17th century, it's a little different. But certainly in the Middle Ages, Europe is, is, is a rather it's rather chaotic in some ways. You have this thing called the Holy Roman Empire that traces its roots back to Charlemagne. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which is, is this sort of loose confederation of states ruled by an emperor, but where the most powerful people are really the barons, the kind of the lower level of the nobility. Uh, you have a country like uh, England, where England has a, has a king, but there's always tension between the, uh, the king and the barons. One thing you don't have, of course, is anything resembling... Uh, representative democracy or, or republican government. Uh, what, what you essentially have in Europe is, is a kind of feudal nobility, very top down, but also somewhat chaotic. And when you think about so many of the things that, that bind nations together today, one of which is you know, being able to transmit information, having a common identity built on common information, a common way of thinking. Those weren't available in the, in the Middle Ages. So the printing press had not yet been developed. Not many people could read. So life would not have been as quite as self-conscious in terms of what we would now call nationhood and national identity uh, as it would have been back then. Borders okay, but, would have been much more porous and, and less well-defined. But, but let's get back to, so people are dying all over the place. Yeah. Who, do I, who do I turn to? Well, by and large, people would turn to, to the church. Uh, again, one of the characteristics of, of early modern slash pre-modern society, and really before the late 17th century, is that uh, uh, the church was seen as uh, critically important for uh, the care of, of, of souls and of bodies. I mean, in the Middle Ages, many of the, the hospitals uh, that were founded were founded by religious orders or by the church. So the church was seen as, as fundamental to uh, holding society together and as providing both uh, physical and spiritual care during these times of, of terrible crisis and trauma. Now, I'm wondering, isn't that a little bit different perspective than the average person in the street might have today. There, there seems to be a perception that somehow the church was against medicine or was against science. Is that wrong? Well, uh, uh, like all like all things that grip the popular imagination relative to the church, uh, there's a certain amount of truth to that. We're all aware of the battles with Galileo and some of the developing uh, uh, astronomical science. Uh, but, but the danger is that we take that as being normative and a universal picture of, of the church's attitude to these things as a whole. And certainly when it comes to, uh, to medicine, uh, there is a, a big overlap between, uh, between the church and, and early modern medicine. And you even see that epitomized in certain individuals. In, in the 17th century in England, there's a famous uh, minister, Richard Baxter, Many Christians know Richard Baxter because he wrote a little book uh, called The Reformed Pastor, which has become a, a kind of classic of pastoral ministry. But Baxter was also uh, the local physician in his, his parish. I, I have a horrible feeling that he was killing people's bodies with this terrible medicine as fast as he was saving their souls with his preaching. Uh, but that's a, he's a good example of where there was this, this huge overlap. And, and the, the old idea that 
religion and science are always at war with each other. Uh, they, ne they can never be reconciled. And that this plays over into the care of bodies in something like the Middle Ages or the early modern age. It, it's simply more complicated than that rather simplistic myth uh, would make, would have you believe. Well, there's certainly, um, and I'm tempted to get down the side road uh, of on Richard Baxter. Uh, uh, interesting, he was a universalist. Uh, most people don't realize. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that detail that just shocks people, you know. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, these none of these people are as pure um, in their thought processes sometimes as we think. But I, you know, there certainly is an overlap in the area of care. Tell tell yeah. us some stories of the struggle as the church really was the forefront of caring for people in the midst of this suffering. Yeah. Do you have any stories you can tell? Well, just as a piece of sort of general background, I want to say one of the things I think that was, was very close to people really up until relatively recently, uh, this is not something that ends at the end of the 17th century. I would say it's something that's really ended in the last 50, 60 years. Uh, death was very close to people that, uh, for example, a young person would probably have seen a dead body. Uh, people would go to worship in churches uh, next to the graveyards where their parents, their ancestors, their siblings were buried. So people were much more familiar with the to sort of put it slightly paradoxically, the presence of death in life. You know, the Book of Common Prayer has that line, in the midst of life, we are in death. So the first thing I think to realize in, in, in most people's imaginations, death is not really uh, a stranger, so to speak. And I think one of the things that's been revealed over the last couple of weeks, couple of months in, in, in the West, in particular the affluent West, is death's a real stranger to most people now. We, we, we push it to the margin. So death was, was much more part of everyday life in the, in the, in the pre-modern and early modern age. And that inevitably meant, I think, that people uh, were much more concerned to have the church present as well. Because when you were dying, who did you want to be with you when you were dying? Well, in the Middle Ages, you wanted the parish priest. You wanted him there to, to administer the final rites and to reassure you as you pass from this life into the next that everything was going to be okay. It gets a bit more complicated in the Reformation. We still have Roman Catholic parish priests doing the same thing. But we then also have Protestant priests and ministers doing their equivalent. Who, who do you want with you when you're dying? You want your minister there to, to read passages of scripture to you, to press upon you uh, the importance of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the, the church was, we might say, much more in demand uh, because death was more present. When you think of the church today, a lot of people, uh, I think a lot of people go to church for what they can get out of it, for how they live their lives now. Joe Lowstein is the most extreme example, perhaps with, well, maybe not the most extreme, but, but the, the most obvious example with his book, uh, Your Best Life Now. Uh, that's a very modern approach to church. And of course, by and large, the church can't give you as much fun as the world can. So it sort of lost its appeal. But in the, in the Middle Ages, in the Reformation, right up until really the, you know, the invention of things like penicillin, where death is much more of a presence in life. I think the church was seen as being, yeah, it's, it's necessary to have a church there because, man, we're all going to die. I, 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 friends of mine have died. It means my circle is not untouchable. My family is not untouchable. People of my age are not untouchable. And therefore, the church takes on, uh, uh, has an appeal in people's minds because these are the people who are going to be there for me at the one moment when I really need them there. And that's my final moments on earth. Let, let's even just think of that now for a minute. I mean, it's almost Carl hard not to go there and to kind of get selfish and personal in the midst of this um, as, as we're having to change our individual lives, not a generic principle, not a theory, no, my life is being touched. And, and to get really trivial, um, people are in crisis over toilet paper. 
Yeah. Really? We, yes. we've, gotten to the, yeah. we've gotten to the place in culture where people are thinking that toilet paper is a necessity. Yeah. I, I have to say, I put toothpaste above toilet paper. You know, I can find substitutes <laughs> for toilet paper. Toothpaste would be difficult to switch. That's, sorry, carry on, John. No, no. I, but I, I mean, the other things that are amazing, it's paper goods, disposable mm. goods are all of a sudden of what people are seeming to have crises over. Yeah. And yet at the same time, that's the trivial side. But the other side is, yeah, but you know, maybe I've had a bad experience with church. And sometimes yeah. that bad experience came about because that minister wasn't there in yeah. my time of yeah. need. Yeah. Or he was there and was there too much. I have a very good friend that that had a death in her family and the, and the minister was very supportive and the church was very supportive. And then he got just a little too encouraging mm -hmm. and too personal and man, talk about not wanting to come again yeah. when the guy ends up taking advantage of this woman. Um, you kind of get this whole mix of, yeah, that's why people aren't listening. But then again, wow, you know, maybe life isn't about happiness. Yeah, maybe yeah. it's something more. And I think in your church, you actually have a confession that talks about what the chief end of man is. What's that about? Yeah, we have uh, we have we, we hold to what we call the Westminster Standards, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, a larger and shorter catechism, which were documents produced by a, an, Eng an assembly of English ministers or predominantly English ministers in the middle of the 17th century. And uh, the first question of the shorter catechism is about the chief end of man. The chief end of man is to uh, uh, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So it's a very God-centered purpose for human beings. Uh, the purpose of life is not that I should feel good about myself. That's a kind of, we now call, I suppose, a therapeutic ideal that the purpose of life is to have that inner sense of personal satisfaction with all that we do and all that we think. No, the purpose of life is sort of outwardly directed that my life is, is not my own. It's to be given over to, to glorifying God. And then in eternity, I will enjoy him forever. Hey, so wait, it's, wait, it's very wait, outwardly you... directed. Wait, you said in eternity. I, I thought we would be, if it's to glorify God, and that seems to be the one that gets mm. the emphasis. And now I'm starting to feel guilty because glorifying God, and I think of my, those things I did today so far that don't glorify God, but there doesn't get as much emphasis on and enjoy him. Yeah. That forever starts now, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that the, the idea of, of, church in many ways and, and this may be very odd for some of your listeners to hear it put this way because their experience of church may not be like this at all uh, but church in some ways is supposed to be a little taste of heaven on earth a little anticipation of what we're going to have in eternity thankfully we know that eternity will be a whole lot better even than our best church experiences but yes the the enjoying god uh, is to start now but that needs to be qualified because the language of enjoyment of course, is, is something that our culture is very familiar with and very comfortable with. But enjoyment for us, by and large, goes back to that inner sense of personal satisfaction. Enjoyment is doing what I feel like doing that makes me feel good. Uh, enjoying God is, is not to be conceived of in those terms. It's much more living a life of principled obedience for God, which by definition also means for other people and for their welfare, for their happiness, not for my own personal satisfaction. Tell me um, a couple stories that come to your mind out of history of people who got that enjoy God thing, where it hit them that, wow, God wasn't that judgmental ogre in the sky who was only to be feared in a nasty kind of way and discovered a God they could enjoy. Yeah. Uh, the most obvious example, of course, and you know, I think you're throwing me a softball here, John, the most obvious example is, is Martin Luther, the, the famous 16th century reformer who for some years uh, prior to becoming a prior to becoming a Protestant reformer, uh, for some years was a monk, member of a monastic order, and really sought to try to uh, appease God. He felt God was angry with him, that he, he did not measure up. And he, he tried through his own good works 
to appease this angry God. And at some point, uh, scholars debate over the details, but at some point when he's working through Paul, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, book in the New Testament, uh, he comes to realize that actually God is not this uh, unremittingly wrathful father figure in the sky. Uh, actually, God is a God who, because human beings have, have rebelled against him, plunged themselves into uh, rebellion against the Lord God, their maker, far from actually acting to, to wipe them off the face of the earth or destroy the universe and start all over again, actually sent his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to, sort of take, to take the punishment for our our sins and for luther that was an incredibly liberating thing because it didn't mean that he stopped doing good but it transformed his motivation for doing that in that in the past he'd done good because he felt he was trying to earn god's favor uh, after he discovered this truth then we, we might say he was he was more like a son of god himself in that that he acted towards uh, towards god and towards others he did good towards them as for example uh, I, I might do good because my, I know my father loved me. I, I, I didn't work to earn my father's love. I worked hard at school because I knew he loved me. And that was the spur and the motivation. So Luther is the great example of that. Uh, and interesting enough, of course, he has a plague connection because in 1527, he wrote this uh, uh, short text on whether one may flee from a deadly plague, which was addressed to Christians. Says, you know, if you're I, Christian, I, was just, I was assuming we were going to get into this one, because this, <laughs> this is a big deal, right? Because Luther it's, has his people who are experiencing just what we're experiencing yeah. without knowing about social distancing very yeah. much, but they kind of did, didn't they? People were yeah. fleeing. Oh, people, people, yes, people were fleeing. And it's, you know, I'd recommend any listener, whether you're a Christian or not, you, you find a copy of this online. It's been all over the internet in the last couple of weeks. It's a great little text. And what's interesting about it is the kind of questions that Luther's answering from his parishioners are precisely the questions we might ask today. Um, the, on one hand, there's, there's one group of people who are saying, you know, the, the plague, it's the judgment of God. And if we flee from the plague, we're fleeing God's judgment. And that's disobedient. We need to kind of stand around and take it. And we've seen that said by some members of the clergy who, who sort of uh, adamantly said, no, we're going we're gonna to meet. And, and of course, they've come under, I think, to some extent, correct censure from people for, for acting in a way that's really arguably very irresponsible. Um, but on the other hand, the, the question is, okay, if, it, if it's okay to flee, should everybody just head to the hills? And then Luther, Luther there says, you know, no, it, it's not quite as simple as that because people have responsibilities. Um, first of all, he says, you know, medical people have responsibilities to, to care for those in their care. As I've said earlier, the medical care was, was limited, so we have to be charitable. <laughs> uh, may have been good if a few of them had fled and not cared for people, given what they were dishing out. But, but even so, that the point is, if you're in a caring profession, Actually, you may have an obligation to stay and care for people. If you're, if, if you're in a family, you may have a, an obligation to, to, to look after your family. Uh, if you're a clergyman, uh, you may have an obligation to, to stay and, and, and shepherd your parishioners. And of course, the, the thing we need to remember is that, that, that flight in uh, the 16th century when Luther was writing is to some extent a little bit like um, lockdown today. It's, it, it was the privilege of, of the well-off, by and large. They were the ones who could go off to their houses and their castles in the countryside. Um, I read something very moving recently about uh, the virus in Africa and saying, you know, one of the problems in Africa is hunger is very real and the virus is invisible. And poor people who ba literally live day to day by what they can work in order to, to be able to eat. They don't have the privilege of, of the kind of lockdowns that we have in, in the West. So Luther right. was aware of, of that kind of question as well. Um, so it's a very interesting, very interesting text. And the other thing he, he makes very clear in this text is we should all prepare to die. <laughs> he does, you know, he presses that home. He says, this is a reminder that, that we're all going to die. Maybe we won't die in this plague, but it's coming for us at some point, the Grim Reaper. And it's, it's, it's a time, not necessarily to say, this is God judging us, but it is a right. time to remind ourselves we are mortal. 
we're going to die, we have to face the question of death in a very individual and very personal way at some point. Now is the time to start thinking seriously about that. And I wish I had the time to let you take it from there because we happen to be recording this on uh, Good Friday. And, but Carl, I, I, I just want to take this time to say thank you. I hope you're going to come back because we tackle a lot of things um, that you could provide some insights to. Let me just say a, a few words before we go. Um, I, think, I think we provided more than a few things that are worth a thought. I'm struck by the fact that so many of us have opinions and come to conclusions without really knowing the facts. But even after getting what we think are the facts, we might want to look again and, and get another viewpoint. And just like our flawed leaders of today, uh, both in and outside of the church, people in the past were mixed bags. They weren't all good or all bad. They didn't have all the answers and none of the answers. So it's my prayer for our listeners um, that you will seek wisdom beyond your quick conclusions or knee-jerk responses to sin in this world and in yourself. There is hope and there is another side. From those of us at Church Hurts, may you have a joyous Easter. Yes, Jesus was murdered on a cross 2,000 years ago, but there's more to that story, and I suspect there may be more to yours too, and it's worth a thought. Wow. <laughs> Is that okay? Wow. Uh, I'm not just saying this because I'm saying this because I was impressed. You guys gave a very fascinating look at what would normally be, if I told my daughter today we talked about the Black Plague, she'd like, what? <laughs> what? What does that have to do with anything? Here? You guys made a real, I had no idea. I'm, I'm a Catholic, so I don't know much about Martin Luther other than he left. Uh, <laughs> He's a bad guy for you. He's a good guy for us. Yeah, right. That guy left. I was so good about that guy. Um, uh, clearly, he pointed out lots of problems that were going on. And um, I had no idea that he wrote this piece. That would be fascinating to put up. And because you say it's all over the internet, I'm all over the internet. Yeah. I haven't seen one piece on that that Luther said, hey, maybe you shouldn't take off. Maybe we're here supposed to be here to help people. Like heck I am. They're sick and I'm leaving. Yeah. And that's uh, exactly what he was facing. That's why yeah. it's there. And it's a, it's a very nuanced piece as well, because he doesn't say 